So with that, I'm going to invite Peter to come up on stage. Please welcome Peter Fasolo, our CHRO, Worldwide Vice President for HR. Well done, well done. Why does Bentley get this really cool headset? I get to, I'm the I backup get the dancer, traditional Peter. one. I'm the backup dancer. Okay. He obviously had a lot of time on his hands to I do did. that Lisa, that Lisa chart. I did, did it? Yeah. I did. I, did. <laughs> I, had to, I have to add to your to-do list a little bit. Good morning. I'm Lisa Fasolo. It's nice to see everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Bentley, thank you for that. That was a very great way to start us this morning in helping us really project out and project forward uh, the vision that we have for Johnson & Johnson, for this region, and for certainly for, uh, for HR. I can't tell you how excited I am to be with all of you for the next, uh, the next several days. Um, I want to just first of all thank Bentley and Lisa and Lizzie and MJ and the entire, the entire team for what I know is going to be an incredibly important couple of days for us to engage in, I think, a very, very important set of dialogues and topics together as a team around how we envision and begin to implement the future for our employees starting in Asia PAC. I also want to welcome Jesse Wu. Jesse, uh, Jesse obviously is spending his time today in engaging with us around the importance of the work that's in front of us over the years, uh, years to come. Jesse and I were with the management committee just last week in Shanghai talking to your business leaders about what's going on across the enterprise and the importance of this region and the specific uh, growth that's coming out of this region and why this region has been, but more importantly, will continue to be an extraordinarily important part of the Johnson & Johnson story in years to come. You know this. You know what's happening in your region, the excitement, the energy, the growth that's happening. 25% of Johnson & Johnson employees now are sitting in this region today. By any projection, 2 billion more middle class consumers will emerge onto the world stage in the next 15 years. 90%, by every, any estimation, will be in your region. We as Johnson & Johnson have been in this region for, for 40, 50, 60 years, starting with Australia, coming in to China in the mid-80s. It is close to three, four, in some cases, five times the growth of what we're seeing in our developed markets. There is so much unmet medical need in the world, but specifically in your region. Lung cancer, diabetes, hepatitis C, rising consumerism, appropriate products for your market. We're just getting started. This region is the linchpin of where we're going as an organization, and we need you. We need your leadership, we need your focus, and we need your support as we move forward. Because this region is incredibly important to the growth, the success, not just of Johnson & Johnson. To me, that's secondary. There is too much to do on the world stage. There's too much unmet medical need. There are too many patients, too many customers, and too many consumers that need our leadership. That is our work. We can, we can do our work in any place. We can work for any company. Everyone has a choice. You are choosing to be with Johnson & Johnson because your values and the purpose in your life is matched with who we are as Johnson & Johnson. That's what is so exciting to me personally about the work that's in front of us. I think Bentley is right. It's going to be hard. We'll figure it out. We will experiment together. I'm here to tell you with Jesse, the management committee is behind all of this work 150%, and let's learn together as we move forward. 
What I'd like to do a little bit this morning is just set the agenda that we'll be talking about over the next day and a half in the context of what's happening across the enterprise. We're going to be talking deeply as the day unfolds on enterprise standards and productivity, HR capabilities, the work that's in front of us. But none of this work matters unless it sets or sits in the context of what's happening across the enterprise. Some of this will perhaps be a little bit redundant. Some of it may reinforce what you know. Some of it may be new information. I want to share that with you for just a little bit this morning and then bring up the house lights and then let's talk a little bit about what questions you have so that we can set the stage as we move forward over the next day and a half. So let's get started. The work that we're doing in HR sits in the context of our strategic enterprise. Now, you've seen this chart before, I'm sure in lots of town hall meetings or in, in listening to Alex or members of the management committee or Jesse in a variety of different settings. What's so reinforcing to me every time I put this chart up is it reminds me of the work that's embedded always sits on the foundation of our values. It's very fitting for us to talk about the credo in the 70th anniversary of when it was written. We are in the midst of ensuring that everyone has a chance to talk about our credo, to challenge it, to make sure that we understand that the credo is all about dilemmas. It's all about trade-offs. Bentley talked about that in his opening remarks. If you actually read through the statement of the credo, you'll know that 28 times this simple but powerful document has the word must in it. That the paragraphs of our patients and customers and consumers is linked by the statement and for our employees and our communities and our shareholders. The credo is not about or, it's about every stakeholder mattering. The work that we do in HR is in large part the stewards of our credo, the stewards of our culture. I can't think of a more privileged position to be in, a more proud position to be in as HR leaders, but to be responsible for the environment and the culture that we create across Johnson & Johnson. Our employees expect it of us, they demand it of us, and the work that we do sits on the foundation of our values as embodied in the credo. That's what makes this corporation unique. That's what makes Johnson & Johnson distinctive from any other company that's out there. Again, any one of us can choose to work and to lead in any industry we choose, any company we choose, but we're doing it in a company that's making a massive difference on the world stage in healthcare. Our aspiration for people to live longer, healthier, happier lives. We touch, you touch, your leaders touch. A billion people a day. Why not a billion and a half? Why not two billion? Why not three billion? There's too much to be, to be done. There's too much unmet medical need for us not to aspire to make that number far greater than what it is today. Our strategic principles flow from our values and from our aspiration. These strategic principles have served this corporation extremely well. They are tried, they are tested, they will evolve, they will adapt, but being broadly based in healthcare is incredibly important to Johnson & Johnson. Why? Because you know better than most that the integration of devices and diagnostics and pharmaceuticals, integrated care, in a world where access is required more and more of our patients and our consumers, requires a company that is truly broadly based across the full spectrum of healthcare. That will evolve, it will change over time, but we believe as a management team being broadly based matters deeply and is a competitive advantage. We know we have to manage for the long term. You feel the pressures every day of delivering for the day, the week, the month, the quarter. That pressure to deliver will always be with us while at the same time 
we're constantly looking out next year, 2015, 2016, 2018, the work that we have to do within our own community, within HR, the strategy's right, the priorities are right, the work, though, has to be executed week, month, quarter, year after year, and finding that right balance. And Johnson & Johnson, as we all know, has an unbelievably proud history of long-term growth. We incubate businesses. We acquire products. We in-license. We turn businesses around. This company has an extraordinarily long and proud history of knowing where the trends are going and investing in the long term while at the same time meeting our short-term commitments. That's always the balance that we have to play. And clearly, being decentralized. Now, I would argue that Johnson & Johnson is more decentralized than most companies. But we're not as decentralized as we used to be. We're more matrixed. I think we have to acknowledge the fact that as the years move forward, that learning and leading through a matrix will matter deeply, not only for us personally as leaders, but for those leaders that we support. But being in a matrix, leading in a matrix, doesn't mean we're any less accountable or responsible. And learning that just because I don't have direct accountability inside my unit makes me no less responsible for delivering value to our employees and to our leaders. And we have to learn our way through that. The good thing about this region and when we talk about certainly what the corporation is trying to do from an enterprise standpoint, one China, nine markets in Southeast Asia where we're going as one Johnson & Johnson, Asia Pac being the first region where we will be engaged in rolling out standardization. This region, you will teach us. We will learn from your leadership so that we can begin to transport that learning to other parts around the globe. You have always been an entrepreneurial set of businesses and leaders, and we're calling upon you to help us learn as we manage through our matrix, and as we learn as an enterprise, what does it mean to evolve this great corporation to where the demands of the market are? And of course, we're certainly doing this through values and through people. But no long-term strategy can be done without hitting our short-term priorities. Alex reminds Jesse and myself all the time with the management committee, there is no long-term without the short-term. Now, this, these set of priorities that you've heard Alex talk about, that you've heard Jesse and other leaders talk about, is not clearly the only set of priorities that are going on across the organization but they galvanize and they focus us as a management team around Alex that we have to make sure we deliver on the short term. And I'm proud to say that we are meeting those kinds of commitments that you see on this screen. Under the leadership of Jesse Wu, two years ago, the consumer business, and specifically the U.S. McNeil business, was facing some extraordinarily challenging and difficult times. Under Jesse's leadership, he turned with that management team, got focused, turned the business, and now I can stand up here, not my work, your work, and the work of your colleagues, where 75% of those products that were taken off the market are now back on the US market because of the hard work and the leadership of your colleagues, specifically in the U.S. McNeil unit. That is, to me, a testament of the extraordinary gifted leadership of the U.S. OTC McNeil business. Focus, hard work, and again, our credo in mind, our consumers and our patients and our customers are waiting for those products. By every stretch of the imagination, those of you who are inside of our pharmaceutical business this has been an extraordinary set of years behind us. No, that doesn't come with just luck. That comes with hard work and focus 
over the last four to five years a focus on very, very specific therapeutic areas in neuroscience, in immunology, in infectious disease, in cardiovascular, in oncology, in this market alone, the hepatitis C product, Elysio, having huge success with our patients, where just several years ago, having hepatitis C could have been, could have been a death sentence for many people. Today, because of your hard work and the hard work of our research scientists around the globe, hepatitis C, because of Elysio, is now 90, 95 percent possibly to be cured in a 12-week regimen. That's innovation. That's breakthrough. That's making a difference. That's why we do what we do. The pharmaceutical business, by every objective marker, has been extraordinarily successful. But I remind myself all the time, just because we are doing good doesn't always mean we're in the best shape. So we have to constantly be thinking about what's in front of us. What gaps do we have to fill in our innovation agenda? Where does in-licensing and acquisitions and unmet medical need really have to unfold in our pharmaceutical business over the next several years? Paul Stoffels, our chief scientific officer, is clear with us as he looks out over the next three, four, five years where our gaps are, where we have to fill those gaps in, where we have to make sure in opening up innovation centers, our last one to be opened up in Shanghai this year, where we have to be agnostic to where ideas come from. Innovation centers in Palo Alto, California, in Cambridge outside of Boston, in London, in uh, outside of Haifa in Jerusalem, and our last one in Shanghai complements our R&D and innovation agenda for the corporation. We have gaps to fill. We can't be comfortable. We have to constantly be looking out where the business and where the unmet medical need is. We are integrating, as you well know, the largest acquisition in the history of Johnson & Johnson. Those of you that are in our Depew Synthes business know, with Judy Mitchell and the leadership team, this is hard work. It's two years under our belt. It's hard work. It's integration. But never lose sight of the fact on why we are doing this. Unmet medical need, using trauma as our beachfront for reconstructive orthopedics in the world where you are in terms of the unmet medical need and the patients at the hospital level. We're two years into it. It's hard. It's integrating. It's working. And we have a lot of work to do, but we're on track. And certainly, all that flows into delivering on financial commitments. If you look at the success in 2013, and certainly the first quarter for Johnson & Johnson, objectively speaking, great financial success. You and your leaders are beating expectations, but with that come higher expectations. You know how that works. When you over-deliver, the expectations just keep getting higher and higher. None of our jobs and certainly yours, are not getting any easier. But with expectations and with commitment to excellence comes higher and higher objectives for the corporation. But we should strive to grow faster than the market. We should strive to deliver better financial results so that we can invest it behind innovation and R&D because patients and customers and consumers are waiting. Now, clearly our growth drivers help us put forward our success as a corporation. Innovation is at the heart of everything we do. Everything we talk about over the next day and a half, I don't care if it's enterprise standards and productivity, capabilities, or any topic that we, we choose to engage in over the next day and a half, will have, in my estimation, three themes. Culture innovation, and talent. Our job as HR leaders, make no mistake about it, our job is the job of ensuring the best talent wins at Johnson & Johnson. Ask yourself, are you able, 
are you, are you putting your motivation and your energy in the space of hiring, developing, promoting, retaining, in an environment that's high engagement, to create a culture of innovation? What I worry about all the time, every day, when I travel around Johnson & Johnson, is what am I not seeing? What potential is being untapped? What voice is not being heard? What idea doesn't get out? Those are things that we can't see. You know your business. You know your people. Make sure that no idea gets left unsaid, that no potential gets left unfilled. The credo reminds us that that's our responsibility. It is about innovation. It's about creating a culture of engagement and making sure that ideas flourish through the system, one person at a time, leader by leader. Certainly, we have to execute against those desires. I think by any stretch of the imagination, if you look back over the last couple of years, a lot of the work that all of us have been doing, and certainly the work that we have to do within our own function, is, is great evidence of getting things done through execution. Just think about, just go back, you can go back three years, you can go back five years, of the evolving nature of Johnson & Johnson. Supply chain, one global supply chain. Four years into it, five years into it. Hard work, 55,000 of our employees, 120 manufacturing facilities, 800 external manufacturers, 300 distribution centers, under one matrixed environment. That's execution. Every day, ensuring that high quality, reliable products get into the hands of surgeons, of consumers, of patients. As I travel, like many of you do, I have the utmost regard and pride when I'm out on a manufacturing floor with our employees. Those 55,000 employees, day in and day out, are ensuring that those products are world class. That's execution. That matters. That's as important, if not more important, than strategy. One global medical organization under, under Joanne Wallstriker, that's execution. That's a global platform. Think about our own function. You've heard me say time and time again, you've heard other leaders, we've reflected on it together as a team. What we do as HR is more similar than it is different. That's why the journey that we're on, common process, harmonized policies, workday technology, not because, as Bentley mentioned in his opening remarks, process matters. Process does matter so that we can do the work that we need to do. Hire, promote, develop, retain, engage our workforce because we have so much to do. ESP, the why behind ESP is so that we can ensure that we are delivering value on a world stage in healthcare. We have to do that through common execution. Execution does matter. Execution is what we do day in and day out so that we can free up our energy to ensure that we're doing the right thing on behalf of our employees. Global reach and local focus is always important. You know better than most. Our, our growth continues to come more and more from outside the US. 55% as we sit here today, OUS. That will become 58 and 60% as the years unfold. In your markets alone, three, four, five times the rate of growth. That's where the world is, that's where it's going, and that's why this region is so incredibly important to the current and future success of Johnson & Johnson. And of course, leading with a purpose has always been the center point of J&J. Of J &J. Now, these enterprise growth enablers, I won't walk through all the details on this. I just want to highlight a few, though. If you walk through the seven that are listed here, three of them are being 
tested and implemented here. That should be an acknowledgement and a recognition of the confidence that we have in your leadership and the confidence we have in the line executives that you support. When Jesse was asked by Alex to be the first chairman of China, it was first and foremost because of Jesse's experience, his credibility, his knowledge, not only of the region, but specifically of China. And we needed to ensure that we had one face to the government, platforms that tie our seven businesses together, our 10,000 employees, our almost $3 billion in business, the growth that will continue to emerge from China. The government, as you know, is pouring $100 billion, $150 billion into the market in healthcare in China alone. We have earned the right to, the, to that stage as Johnson & Johnson. You have created the reputation of Johnson & Johnson in China. Jesse will talk more in his remarks about where that's going. But make no mistake about that, we are moving in the right direction. And this region, and China specifically, is a great testimony to the work of this region and those of you who are working in China specifically. We are testing, we are testing a go-to-market model in nine markets in Southeast Asia. Many of you are in the midst of that with Kim Taylor and your managing directors in those nine markets. We're going to learn tons. And we're going to take those learnings and we're going to deploy those in other parts of our globe. I don't know where we'll go next, but we'll go. When the timing is right, making sure that we go to market as Johnson & Johnson, at the hospital level, at the surgeon level, that we take advantage of the breadth and the depth and the scale of J&J. &J. And of course, enterprise standards and productivity, not only in our, our function of HR, but in finance and IT, working together to implement flawless process. I'm not naive here, folks, and I need your help. We're just getting started. We have to make sure that we are constantly talking back and forth to each other. Where are we learning? Where do we have to speed up? Where do we have to slow down? Where are we not ready? We have to constantly make sure that our lines of communication are wide open. I have to hear what you say to us. You have to understand from, from our perspective why we're going in this direction. But I don't have a perfect playbook here. I'm going to have to learn with you. And my commitment to all of you is we will not go. We will not move forward. We will not implement until we all feel confident that we go in the right pace and in the right direction. I'm not about getting it done fast. I'm about getting it done right. And we have to learn together on keeping our channels wide open. And that's my personal commitment to all of you as we unfold that journey together as we go into 2015. We have to get our work right. We have to develop it right. We have to harmonize. We have to make sure we put it on a platform. You've been able to demonstrate in six of the markets that Workday is a doable platform. It's being rolled out or has been rolled out, certainly, as you know, in Japan and China and other places. So we're learning from you. We're learning from you. But we have to make sure that we get it right on behalf of our employees. And certainly, during the Q&A in a few minutes, I'd be happy to talk about any of these other enterprise growth enablers. And this was our attempt as a management committee, Jesse, myself, with the management committee, to acknowledge that there are certain things that have to be done and perhaps tapped at the top of the organization to demonstrate that we have to move forward. Enterprise standards and productivity, One China, Southeast Asia, innovation, reputation. These are things that are important for the enterprise. They're certainly important for the region and the operating units, but we're paying attention to them as a management team at the top of the organization. The why of what we're doing all the time has to be in the scope of unmet medical need. This is simply to remind us that expanding access is what we do. In your markets alone, 
the growth, the number of middle, of middle class consumers coming into your markets is explosive. We have to, we have a responsibility as J&J &J to make sure that we are answering those market demands. And certainly, innovation always, always gets rewarded. And that's why as HR leaders, it is imperative that we are stewards of our environments. That, stewards, that stewardship is guided through our credo, but engagement matters, voice matters, participation matters, promoting on ability and promoting on merit matters. This is our work as we reward innovation. We have to integrate care and certainly focus on wellness and prevention. Thick and I were talking at breakfast this morning under, under his leadership as our chief medical officer for the corporation, how we have to ensure that we do not cede this ground to any other company. Wellness and prevention, more than sick care, is where the world is and where it's going. Johnson & Johnson has a proud history of wellness and prevention, but we're just scratching the surface. We have lots of small work going on across the organization. And under Lisa Alvarez Calderon's leadership and others, we're starting to understand how we can scale wellness, prevention. My personal goal with FIC and others is to have the healthiest workforce on the planet, to make sure that we're role modeling what does it mean to be spiritually healthy, physically healthy, and making sure that our energy is directed towards purpose. No one other than Johnson & Johnson should own that space. We have earned that right, and we have to make sure that we advance that on behalf of patients and customers on a world stage. What does it mean for HR? You know what this means. It's all about talent. Our job is the talent game. We have to work with leaders like Jesse, our managing directors, our company group chairs. We have to be called into the room of our business leaders, not because we've implemented a very good process. We have to be called into the room of our business leaders because our opinions about who we should put in a job, who we should promote, who we should advance, who we should retain, that's why we're called into the room. That requires unbelievable business acuity really, really good skills at knowing what good looks like, knowing how to pick winners. Our job as HR leaders is the talent game, and that's what we're striving for. We go to our employees through processes, compensation, benefits, training, talent acquisition, organizational talent reviews. That's all process. We have to ensure that that's flawless. But at the end, the Jesse Woos of the world will call us into the rooms because our opinion about who we should put in a box matters. And that means that we have to understand where the business is going, what the pressures are short and long, what the optimal organizational design should be, where the risks are, and who we should, who we should promote. That's our work. You know that, we know that, we have to do that together. You have to help the organization know who your talent is, who's a country player, who's a regional player, who's a global player. Not every person needs to be an enterprise player. Not every person needs to be a regional player. We need a mix. I need your views, I need your opinions, I need your judgments on where people need to play, country, global, regional, and we have to make sure that that mix gets right. You are on the front lines helping us make those judgments. We need you to fuel the pipeline of Johnson & Johnson because no strategy will get executed. No patient will be served. No consumer will be addressed without the men and the women on a global scale that you and others have a responsibility to identify on behalf of the organization. That is our work moving forward. That's what enterprise standards and productivity is about. It's about freeing up our energy to advance talent. 
and to make sure that the diversity of thought and perspective on a global scale is making its mark in Johnson & Johnson and making sure that leaders understand that their job is to make sure that they have people around them that are better than they are individually. The role of leadership is making sure that you create energy with people around you to create venues for them so that the best idea wins. No leader is any smarter than any other individual at Johnson & Johnson. All leaders have is a different angle on a problem. They see it from a different perspective. The job that we have in picking leaders is making sure that first and foremost, they represent our values. The credo is binary. Secondly, they have to demonstrate performance in good markets, bad markets, turnarounds. They have to know the what and the how, not just delivering the what, but making sure that they're role models for our leadership imperative. That's performance. You don't get to be promoted in advance unless you demonstrate our values and that you have a track record of performance in what and how. That you have a learning agility, that you know that you have confidence of going into situations where you haven't faced before. But as importantly, and maybe even more importantly, you know how to build unbelievable, diverse teams. The world is too global, it's too distributed, the environment requires too much collaboration, not for us to have leaders who know how to unleash the power of people around them. That's perspective. That's knocking down barriers. That's making sure that leadership is about getting the best out of every individual so that the collective answer is better than any individual on the team. Leadership is about conflict. It's about individual conflict. It's about team conflict. It's about organizational conflict. Systems like Johnson & Johnson, global companies like Johnson & Johnson, only advance through people because you can navigate through legitimate trade-offs and conflict. Our job as HR leaders is to navigate that, is to make sure that you don't compromise on what the end game is. That's our role as HR leadership. This is our agenda. It's our agenda yesterday. It's our agenda today. It's our agenda when I come back year after year after year. We are in the talent game, and enterprise standards and productivity is the platform through which we will deliver on this agenda. Our priorities are clear. Talent, our partnership has to be flawless with our global functions, that's the other advantage, certainly, of standards and productivity. We're not going it alone. We're doing it with our IT colleagues, with our finance colleagues, with our line leaders. If you could have heard Thibault, who was presenting enterprise standards and productivity with us last week in Shanghai, he said it better than I could have ever stated about why we are doing this. He said to us, we need standard platforms. We have the line leaders behind us. We have our colleagues in the global functions marching with us. We will get this done together, but we will learn. It's about talent and partnership and ensuring that our engaged credo culture ensures that we create that kind of engagement and that the capabilities of our own function is constantly being tested and growing and challenging. At the end of the day, our scorecard at the end of all the conversation, our scorecard is very simple. Is our talent pipeline stronger and better? Do we have greater breadth and depth of talent at the local, regional, and global level? level? That's our scorecard. That's what we must hold ourselves accountable for. Do the enterprise growth enablers, and specifically One China, Southeast Asia, One J&J, &J, and Enterprise standards and productivity. Are we meeting those milestones? Are we learning? Are we delivering on that? And do we create an environment where our employees say to us, I feel free to give my views. I'm engaged with the agenda. I'm able to voice my views on moving this great corporation forward. 
we have a responsibility as HR leaders to create that kind of environment. Our scorecard is pipeline, hitting the deliverables that we say are important to the corporation, and making sure that our environment is credo-based, high engagement, and, th and thrives in innovation in the markets that we have the privilege to serve. So in closing, let me end where I started. Values, credo, that's what matters. Always keep in mind that the work that we do starts and ends with our patients, our customers, our employees, the communities in which we have the privilege to serve. We do that well, and we will do fine financially. The credo matters. It mattered when it was written 71 years ago. It matters as much, if not more, today because it is a competitive distinguishing factor for Johnson & Johnson. So with that, I want to thank you for your leadership, for what you've done, for what you will do, and let's learn together because the future is bright for Johnson & Johnson. So thank you very much. Let's open it up for some Q&A. A tough time finding this room this morning. I just followed these footsteps, so they, ha they must serve a purpose for some reason. Look, we've got some time, I think. I don't know, we've got uh, 15, 20 minutes or so. We can go in any direction that you're comfortable with. Nothing's off limits. Ask questions. Give me some Wonder feedback. I'll give the tough ones to the team. So go ahead. Someone, someone Good morning, start. Peter. I'm Juslin. I'm Where going to ask you the first you? question. Um, when you talk about, you know, um, the talents, um, about, you know, what HR do is all about the talents, uh, I want to, you know, know more from you, you know, what should the, um, you know, HR in Asia Pacific should do more of when you see, you know, what we are doing today? What do you want us to do more of, you know, instead of what we are doing, you know, today? Well, I, first of all, thank you for the question. I, I do think the, the, the whole view of our work around talent is it, it's making sure that the pipeline and the choices that we have as a corporation are there. I, what, I, what I often see, not, I, I see quite frequently is we're not, we don't have the kind of choices that we need when either jobs emerge or when the pipelines have to be advanced. What I find very exciting about this region is the, the energy and the entrepreneurship of the leadership you have in your markets has to advance through the system at Johnson & Johnson. I've shown in other presentations where the team has helped me understand this, that most, not all, but most of our moves, talent moves, still happen within sector or within region. And there's lots of reasons for that, and we can, we can talk about you know, what your views are. But that's a necessary but not sufficient condition for the energy and the leadership pipeline of the corporation to advance. And what I'd ask of this region is, help me change that. The, the, the talent that you have coming out of this region Help me identify the real regional players, the cross-sector players, the global players. You know, we, as Jeannie knows, in her leadership team, we, we move five, 600 global assignees around the world every year through our IDP and, and other programs. And yet, we have to make sure that those, those leaders find, them, find themselves in big jobs for the corporation. So, Make sure that this region is a role model for the talent pipeline for not just your country and region, but for the corporation. Because you guys have the talent, and we need, we need to pull them through the system so we have more choices when big jobs open up. So that's what I would ask for. Yes. Peter, good morning. Uh, this is Abhishek from Vietnam. Uh, my question is uh, for one JJ Southeast Asia is one of the things that uh, it's enablers. What are some of the success parameters that you look at uh, for the one JJ Southeast Asia model from an HR perspective? Yeah. Well, it's a great question, and before I answer it from 
an HR perspective, ultimately the test for one Johnson & Johnson in the nine markets in Southeast Asia will be growth. It'll be growth. It'll be unmet medical need. Are we getting to more patients and customers and consumers in a way that we otherwise would not have been able to do through our individual lines of business? That will probably start at the hospital level because that's where the synergies and the opportunities uh, will present themselves. Uh, secondly, I'd say I would expect greater innovation coming from, from those markets. So from an HR perspective, if you translate growth and innovation, what should we be doing in those markets alone? Teach us. Teach the corporation what does it mean to go to market and create an environment that is more Johnson & Johnson, a more country model as opposed to a sector model. And of course, you need both in the trade-offs and, and you have to navigate your way through it. But, but those of you who that are, that are serving in those nine markets um, with, uh, with Kim and others, we need to learn from you on what does it mean to make those kinds of trade-offs. Where will we, um, where do we need to move forward? Where doesn't it make sense? So I'd ask culture, innovation and talent. I keep, I keep coming back to those three issues and we'll learn from you because what we have to do, the next big discussion we have to have as a management committee with Jesse and with Kim and others is where do we go next? How does this work? What have we learned? Um, do we move faster? And these are things that you know, we, just, we just don't know where to, where to take it next. But you're gonna, those of you who are working with us on that, you're going to have to teach us. Other question. It's just dinner time for me. I just, I'm just warming up. I woke up at 3.30 and I started texting people. No one would answer me. <laughs> yes. Uh, morning, Peter. I'm Trupti. I support supply chain. Uh, thanks a lot for a very inspiring uh, session. It was good to hear uh, your direction. And one of the things that you talked about was that increasingly we're becoming less decentralized and more matrixed. Um, what are your thoughts, and because you see, hear so many dialogues, and how is it that we can continue to build capability in the organization of working in the matrix, because the matrix is growing? Terrific, terrific question. And I don't, I'm not sure that my answer will be all that satisfying, because I think we're learning. And it is, you know, the definition of leadership at Johnson & Johnson uh, is different today than if we were having this conversation maybe five or ten years ago, right? And, and maybe to, to the heart of your question, we haven't, we haven't dialogued enough about that, right? So what does it mean to be a matrix leader today at Johnson & Johnson? I'll give you my views, right? And, and I think we probably have to back that up with more investments behind philosophies and teaching. But it does require unbelievable collaboration. Collaboration in a different way, right? So. Um, if you don't own the full value chain, if you're a commercial leader and you don't own the full value chain, it doesn't mean you're any less, um, less responsible for it. So what does that mean? Do you back away from it? Well, of course not. But what it does mean is you now have to collaborate across the enterprise in a fundamentally different way. And I, I do want to make a, distinguish, a dis distinction, at least in my mind, between collaboration and consensus, because the, the distinction is important for me. I'm not looking for 100% consensus. That will throw sand in the gears, so to speak. It'll slow us down. You do have to collaborate, though. It's, and I've said this in other, other venues like this. My personal belief is it's very hard to make a big mistake at Johnson & Johnson because of the unbelievable expertise and 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 leadership and people we have in the organization. I'm, I'm amazed every day of how I'm learning from people. Where we'll make mistakes is when we don't lift our head up and sort of look to the right or look to the left and, and learn from others. Now, at some point, you have to move forward. So collaboration, to me, 
is extremely important in a matrix. Um, you have to really know how to influence without direct authority. So this notion of leadership around you can work up and down the chain of an organization from the lowest levels in the organization up to the boardroom. This notion of behavioral flexibility, I don't know what the term is, other than you just, you have to be extremely gifted at listening and recognizing that you don't have the answer. You know, th this notion of humility and not having to be the smartest person is, is, is a derailer. If, if you think you, we're too big, we're too global, we're too complex that the answer resides in any one person. So you ha from a leadership standpoint, you have to acknowledge the fact that you don't have the answer. You have a point of view. That's not the answer, though. I have opinions on lots of things. My family reminds me every day how my opinions aren't right. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the opinion, so you have to make sure that you, you can collaborate, build great teams, and work through the matrix. That, to me, this command and control, this position power, this I'm the boss, those days are gone. They're not just going, they're gone. You can't influence a system of Johnson & Johnson's breadth and depth and scale through position power. You must influence it by engaging, by enlightening, by teaching, by making sure that you're bringing the best out of people. That, to me, is the leadership of today. I don't think that's unique to J&J, &J, but it's certainly a different model for us. So just some thoughts. Now, we have to probably do more to dialogue about it, teach it, skill build around it. That, to me, is where I think maybe I'm falling a bit short on my answer. Other questions? Yes, thanks. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Pu Ping from China. So my question is that now, uh, as you talk about Oh, I think I'll, yeah, I'll just need to switch. Yeah, there. okay. Um, so um, we talk about, you know, it's, uh, uh, to accelerate growth of Johnson & Johnson, we may need to have an emerging market strategy, and also we talk about value segments. So from your perspective, what's the most uh, top three areas in this region we as uh, HR professionals can help to realize that kind of uh, uh, goal or uh, value in the future? Yeah, great, great question. Thank you for that. The, um, certainly, the emerging markets, you've heard and you've heard others talk about just where the real growth is coming from. Now, the trick is making sure that we invest very significantly behind the emerging markets at three or four times the growth, while at the same time making sure that our developed markets are getting the investments as well. And you know, it's, it's obvious, you have to do both, right? Now, that being said, being able to differentially invest is really important in this region. When you look at our strategic plan, and Jesse and I with the management committee are looking out you know, through 2020, but when we back it in a little bit closer, we know that this region is going to be a massive contributor to that growth. So then what do you do? Well. Part of it is when the businesses, when the global businesses, when Johnson & Johnson is doing better, when the expectations are being, um, uh, being over-delivered, we have to differentially invest in some of these markets in business building opportunities, okay? So we're having that conversation right now as a management committee. Jesse and I will be going to a meeting next week where we're gonna have a conversation on where, if we had the choice, we could invest now, this year, to make sure that 2015 is a little bit better. And we'll have that debate. It'll come to this region. It'll come to R&D. It will come into other, other businesses. But one thing that we're going to ask as a management team is, 
Whatever we do this year has to be business building, has to be about growth. And this is where the region really is important. I think in this market, having market appropriate products that are priced to the market matters deeply. You're seeing some of that investment, especially in medical device and diagnostics. I think we have to get that a little bit better in terms of differentially investing. And I think the third point I'd make is we do need a, an emerging markets, a differentiated talent strategy for emerging markets. You all have taught me as the years have unfolded that being a leader in, a, in an emerging market is different. The profile is different. The expectations are different. And yet that profile can travel to other emerging markets or to the developed markets. And I think I need personally to do a better job engaging our teams in what does it mean to truly have an emerging market talent strategy that's focused more specifically for J&J. &J. And I think that's where we can learn. Yes. Hi, Peter. This is Victor from Consumer China HR. Uh, my question is very simple. Uh, what's your, maybe not answer, just your expectation uh, in terms of uh, ESP, what is uh, your ideal, your expectation for the role of special group and uh, the role of BBHR, and what kind of relationship between those two groups? Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm glad, I'm really, I'm, I'm thrilled that you asked it because I do have very strong views on that. <laughs> um, I make no distinction. I really don't. I, what's really important to me is 1HR. 1HR is, is very meaningful to me personally, professionally. I don't think there should be any distinction between delivering world-class HR through a multifunctional shared service, through a specialty group, or through a business-based HR. Because the Jesse Woos of the world they don't make that distinction. Why should we? What they expect of us is world-class execution and talent. Now, we do that in lots of different ways. So part of how you get there is, for us from a career standpoint, constantly be collaborating, but as importantly from a career standpoint, move through the various parts of our function. No one function is any more or less important. It really isn't because you can learn different skills and different capabilities. Imagine if part of your career could be spent in leading, supervising, designing world-class processes in talent or total rewards or talent acquisition. You'll learn so much, and those of you who are doing it or have done it, you learn how to collaborate and to execute. Imagine going deep for a period of time in your career in a specialty group where you learn, you have a, a different experience of what does it mean to be a deep talent acquisition person or a talent person, or being on the front line with the business leaders to deliver on behalf of that. At the end of the day, the client, the business leader, cares that we deliver on behalf of their business. And so distinctions between specialist, shared service, and BBHR, that's in our own mind. And I know that this is part of our narrative. It's, it, quite frankly, I don't think it's unique to Johnson & Johnson. Those of you who have been in other companies, those of you who have been, I've been in this, in this space for decades, and this has been an age-old conversation. I think we have to agree that those walls must come way down, stay down, and stay down forever, because we've got too much work to do. So I do have a strong view. Thank you for the question. Are we OK? Should we take uh, one, one more question? Are we OK? Yes. Nice to see you. I think, I think you need a microphone coming. First of all, thank you, Peter, for a very inspiring presentation. Um, 
you know, Asia Pacific as a continent itself is evolving, every country is evolving, uh, external challenges are also evolving. Um, is there something that always worries you about Asia Pac? Is there something that concerns you that you would like us to know? And is there something that we should therefore be watchful of as we go forward on this journey? Great question, thank you. I worry about a lot of things. Um, I think just sort of macro thinking about your region, it's the hyper growth. And I know by any, you know, you, you look at a lot of different ways to cut this and growth may be slowing in some certain parts of your market, but the, the explosive energy and the explosive growth, the youth of many of your markets in Vietnam, um, as an example, in, in parts of your markets in India, in Japan, where the, you know, a large part of that society obviously is over the age of 65, so it's almost in two extremes. Um, so I, I think a lot about the region in terms of bifurcation of youth and energy and then ability to pay, the, market, the, the, the government's ability, willingness to pay for health care. We know, Alex reminds us all the time, the demand for health care will continue to go up, up, and up. The ability to pay becomes challenging. And that's why um, integrated care matters, market access matters, um, making sure that um, we are constantly innovating because the market, generally speaking, does reward for innovation. And we're watching it in our own pharmaceutical space today, right? You saw the last, the last offer from Pfizer to AstraZeneca, $120 billion. AstraZeneca, obviously, they've made their decision to obviously reject it. That's a model that says scale matters. Our model says innovation matters. And we were talking a little bit about this at dinner last night, and if Paul Stoffels were on stage, he'd remind all of us, innovation always wins. And so for your markets, making sure that we learn that where we need to innovate, because the demand is just gonna continue to rise and rise. So innovation has to go hand in hand with that, because if we don't innovate, then we will get caught. We will run the risk of getting sidelined in a smaller conversation, as opposed to a big conversation. So that, those are things that we have to really think about, I think, globally, but, but, but certainly in, in the markets in which, which you all are leading. So I think I'm, I think I'm getting the hook. Let's, let's really learn with each other over the next day and a half. Let's engage together, and let's make sure that we, uh, we move our organization together as a leadership team. So thank you very much. I think we're taking a, taking a break. We're taking a 30-minute break. Thank you. I know everyone is excited to go. If you can just give us five minutes. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's all right, Peter. Um, thank you for that excellent keynote. I know I'm the only thing standing between you and tea break. But before you go, uh, if you could just give us five minutes and sit down. <laughs> I know you're excited to move, and we're going to give you a chance to do that in just... Five minutes. We wanted to make sure that you had a good understanding of how healthy, just how healthy this meeting will be in the next two and a half days. And we have prepared quite a few things for you um, in, in the next two and a half days. Um, caring for our employees' health and well-being is a core credo value. And as Peter has said, we have to role model that. As Alex Gorski has said, our employees are our greatest asset. And by investing in their health, we invest in the success of our business. Now, as more and more employees gain access to the J&J Health Profile tool around the world, we have come to realize what the top two health risks are. And they have become very consistent across the world at Johnson & Johnson. The top two health risks are, based on our statistics, number one, unhealthy eating, and number two, physical inactivity. Now, based on studies, physical inactivity is also the fourth 
leading risk factor for death worldwide. So we're going to do something to address that right here in this meeting in the next two and a half days. And what we're going to do is what we call the two-day pedometer challenge. Now, who among you have done the Global Corporate Challenge last year? Or the GCC? All right, that's great. So you probably know how this is going to work out, right? But we're going to put a little twist to it. So as you keep yourself healthy and fit in the next two days, through the two-day pedometer challenge, we're also going to be able to help the community in the next two days. So that's going to be really great. Now, I'm sure when you received your registration packs, you got a little pulse, which I put right up back here. All right? So if you've got that, I hope you've started to clip it on. We're going to ask you to clip it on, put it in your pocket, or put it in your uh, handbag, but keep it close to yourself, OK? Because this is going to track your steps in the next two days. Now, we're dividing everyone into teams. So in your table, just look around you, those are going to be your teams. The people sitting right next to you, OK? <laughs> this is serious stuff. And we've become very creative at naming the teams, by the way. If you, number one, team number one is the donuts. Team number two, the soda pops. My team, the candy bars, all right? We're doing a little bit of awareness on what kinds of food you're supposed to avoid the next two days, by the way. <laughs> so that's the reason why you're named in this way. Now, each team will pick out a team leader. It could be the healthiest person on the table, could be the most good looking, <laughs> could be the most athletic, we all leave that up to you, all right? The team leader has got a responsibility though. We're gonna be giving out team tracking cards and the team leader will be taking down the team steps every day. So Fick has been the team, he's now the team leader for the donuts, right? He's good looking. He's good looking, he's the fittest, he's the most athletic, and he's the vice president for global health and my boss. <laughs> so definitely he takes, he takes the cake, I know. <laughs> All right, now the team leader is going to go up to you every day in the next two days, tomorrow morning uh, for the first day and Thursday morning for day two, and he's going to be asking you for your steps. Now those steps will go up into the team tracking cards, and the team leader will go back up to the room if you saw a tarpaulin there sitting to track down the steps, the total steps for each of the teams. Now. Based on experience, Asia Pacific loves a good friendly competition, I tell you. So that's our way of tracking how everyone is doing versus the other teams. Now, what is the goal? The goal is for everyone to try to achieve at least 10,000 steps per day, all right? And if you're not into walking, but you prefer swimming, we also have a step conversion for you. So, if you swim at least 100 meters, that's actually going to convert to 475 steps. If you forget that, just come up to me. That's going to be easy. I'm going to tell you the conversion. Now, what is the goal of all of this? We have a goal of achieving 3 million steps over the next two days as a collective effort. And really, I think this underscores our effort as one HR, right? If we are successful in achieving 3 million steps, Johnson & Johnson will be donating 10,000 Malaysian ringgit or 3,000 US dollars to Malaysian Care, a NGO that looks after the needs of children with, children with special needs. I think that's a fantastic proposition, <laughs> right? Especially in light of our 70th year anniversary of our credo. So I think everybody can do their own in keeping themselves healthy and fit in the next two days while helping the community in which we live and work. Now, other than that, we are also doing something to address unhealthy eating. <laughs> so all of your snacks in the next two days are gonna have low glycemic index foods. Now, who among you have heard that from Energy for Performance in Life? All right, great, that's excellent. So it's gonna be quite healthy 
You're going to have peanut butter and sandwich and, uh, with, with, with banana. And your lunch will have a lot of salads, fruits, and vegetables to keep yourselves healthy and your energy sustained all throughout the next two days. All right? So thank you for staying on for a few more minutes. But before you go, we're going to start, by the way. Oh, before I forget, how do we help you boost your team steps? Right? So we're not just going to leave you on your own. We're, we're going to do more for you. How to do that? If you saw this morning, as Peter said, he just followed the steps. So we have come up with a walking trail that goes around this whole area. Just don't step on them because they're made of stickers. They might come off. But if you follow one round, it actually will give you between 250 to 300 steps. All right? And that really is to give you... A, you know, a way of, of keeping yourself energized and moving all throughout the next two days. Secondly, we will have energy breaks in the morning and in the afternoon using the J&J &J official seven-minute workout app. We're not going to ask you to do crunches or planks or push-ups, but we're going to make sure we integrate some of that into the energy breaks in the next two days. Lastly, we, have a, we had a Zumba class this morning. So just so you know, some of them might actually be already ahead of you. <laughs> Those 15 <laughs> that went this morning, we had it at 6.30 in the morning. And however, you're going to have another chance tomorrow because we're going to have another yoga class at 6.30 in the morning in the same venue, Caesar 3, Level 3. All right, so before we go, I'm going to ask the Energy Break team to come up on stage and do the first Energy Break. All right, let's all stand up. Can you hear me? Yeah, just, okay, great. <laughs> I need to call my team. Yep, no, no, it's fine. So uh, you need to find some space. So <laughs> if you feel that you're too close to your, <laughs> to your friends, you probably need to spread out a little bit, yeah? And if you want to take off your shoes for those in high heels, you probably want to do that, yeah? And we are not going to do any push-up, yeah? So, so we are going to do simple ones. Excellent. Yeah, so what we are going to do first is four sets of lounges. So what you need to do is take your le right leg in front, right? And make sure that you come in so that you don't hurt your back. And we are going to go down. Yes, I think Laura, you want to come up and do it? <laughs> and two and three, and four, and we are going to change another leg, one, two, <laughs> three, four, one more time, one, two, three, four, change your leg, one, two, three, four, okay, so this is going to be the fun part. You have to clap four sides. So start with your left, up, two, three, We'll come back at 10.30 in the room. Thank you.